Thank you, Victory Choir. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Um, good morning. It is a wonderful thing to be here with even more light today. Um, Aletha was right. The new lights don't break the, the vibe of the, uh, the, the lines of the room. And we have these great lights. So again, thank you, Mike, for project managing that this week and, uh, and making that happen. Um, before we get started, just a couple of quick things. Uh, we want to wish a happy birthday to Ron. Um, so happy birthday. Um, we're, uh, you know, we're not going to say how old you are, but I will just remind you that Moses didn't get started until he was 80. So, uh, you know, the greatest chapter is still yet to come. So, uh, and then I also would like to just uh, make a note that I uh, send obviously some love and, and, uh, and joy to our, our brother Vadim and his wife Yana in the Ukraine as we have continued to do every week. Um, their roof project is actually going to be done tomorrow, which is uh, a wonderful praise that we were able to be a part of and support, as well as everybody else that donated along the way. Uh, and our, our support for them will continue. Um, they actually, if you look in the, in the order of worship today, there's a little picture that I was sent this morning of some of the work they're doing and, and helping students um, with school supplies and things like that. So, I mean, what an amazing, joyful thing that children are, you know, thinking about school and thinking about Bible study and thinking about being in church rather than, um, you know, missiles and bombs. And I mean, not that the, that, that thing is over, but, um, you know, for, for, for the part of our part with the, the, the brother and sister that we're connected with, their family is safe. And that is an incredible, uh, for the moment, that is an incredible thing. And we, we praise God for that. Um, so let's just uh, take a moment and pray before we get into today's conversation. Lord, thank you for this, uh, thank you for this time and place, this space to come to you, um, to come to join in this, this, these coordinates, these coordinates of this little outpost uh, that you've saw, seen fit to, to, to put in our stewardship, to uh, be a place where we can gather uh, to study your word, hear your word, read your word, pray, um, care for each other. Uh, give, uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper, um, God willing, baptize, and, um, and continue to broadcast your light into a world that desperately needs it. Uh, Lord, we ask that you bless this time today and that everyone who hears this word either today or in the future, that they are blessed by it and they are able to carry it forth as, uh, as, as a gift that they can, uh, they can give to someone else, and that when they feel the encouragement to share this good news, that they do not back away from it. We ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So in 1928, Hitler uh, was writing his second book, or wrote his second book, published his second book. And he, and he had a quote in it, and he said that Germany should concentrate all of its strength on marking out a way of life for our people through the allocation of adequate Ladensraum, the German word for living space, the idea that they needed elbow room for the German people. He says, for the next 100 years, that should be their objective. He says, naturally, the inferior races that occupied the region must be removed. The concept of Lebensraum, or living space, served as a critical component to the Nazi worldview that drove both its military conquest and its racial policies that led to um, the deaths of millions and horrible atrocities, as we know. Uh, but their worldview was that without this space, Germany will not survive. And that story guided all of their principles, guided their worldview, guided their, the way they were looking at the world. They said, well, if we don't have this, then we're going to be killed, so we've got to go take that land. And, Sorry, but we've got to remove these inferior races. Again, there's also a story there that says these races are inferior. So there's a story there that then drove actions that led to results. Um, more presently, just considering our friend Vadim and the situation there, the following words were from Vladimir Putin on February 24th. The purpose of our operation is to protect people who for eight years now have been facing humiliation and genocide perpetrated by the Kiev, Kiev regime. To this end, we will demilitarize and unify the Ukraine, as well as bring to trial those who perpetrated numerous bloody crimes against civilians, including uh, against citizens of the Russian Federation. Vladimir Putin, February 24, 2022. This worldview says 
that uh, we must these people are oppressed, so we must protect them. And that has obviously led to actions that's led to results. Uh, the point here is that both of these um, both of these worldviews are based on what are perceived to be facts, and they created stories that created actions that created results. Stories are powerful things. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about today, about what exactly is a story. Like, we think about that, and we hear the word story, and it can conjure up a lot of things. You can think, well, it's a news story, or the phrase, hey, you're telling me a story, or you're telling a story about this. Uh, the dictionary says, Story, the, the definition is a, an account of imaginary or real people and events told for entertainment. That's one view um, or one definition. A story, a plot or storyline. Uh, this novel has a good story. Uh, a report of an item of news in a newspaper, magazine, or news broadcast. A piece of gossip, a rumor. There have been a lot of stories going around, as you can imagine. Uh, a false statement or explanation. Here's where we get to the part that triggers people. Ellie never told stories. She always, had, she always believed in telling the truth. It's the idea that a story unknown, its face is always false. An account, final definition, an account of past events in someone's life or in the evolution of something or a particular person's representation of the facts of a matter, especially as given in self-defense. During police interviews, Harper changed his story is the, is, the, is the usage there. You can see how a particular person's representations of facts as a matter, especially as given in self-defense, is what we see in the words of Hitler and it's the justification used by Vladimir Putin. Fa frankly, it was used by George Bush. It's been used for countries over and over again that we're doing this in order to protect ourselves or we're doing this in order to whatever it might be. But regardless of whether it was true or not, in many cases you will find, if you look through history, many wars are the result of stories that were not based on facts. They are, uh, they are constructs. And what we're going to talk about today is that we all have stories. And we've all been given stories. And those stories many times are based on things that are not true. These stories that are not based on things that are not, th things that are not true, in fact, based on lies, often control our world and blind us from the actual truth. And when we act on these stories that are based on lies, we create oftentimes destruction. And if we're God's children, at the least case, discipline. So we must be constantly on the hunt for what these stories are that are in our lives. The word of God and acknowledgments, the word of God and acknowledgement of facts over feelings are our best, true, best tools. These facts, these, these, these actions rather, these actions will lead us to facts. The word of God and acknowledgement of the facts lead us to Facts, And when we get into the truth of what our situation is, the outpouring of that is urgency, holy living, action, joy, reward, when we, are land, when we are standing on the truth. But if we ignore these facts and we continue to live in lies, those lies will create the opposite. They'll create delay, sinful living, inaction, guilt and shame, discipline for believers and for, and at worst, destruction for the false teachers that Peter has been teaching us about and those others that reject the truth. Because as we'll see, false teachers use this, this use stories as a vector uh, to ignore facts and create false stories that keep themselves blind and lead others astray in that blindness. But Peter, and where we are now as we pick up in chapter 3, is reminding his flock of the same. The nature of these false teachers and how one of the things they will use is stories that they create based on lies that lead to conclusions that are not true and actions and a way of living that is contrary to what we're instructed to do. So we're going to join Peter here in this letter as he exhorts the, fl the flock back then, but also us today in chapter 3. Um, 
So join me in chapter 3 uh, of uh, the second letter of Peter in verse 1, and now we're going to, uh, to read it. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you, may, that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? Forever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed, was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth are now, that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some should count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed." And we're going to capture that next one, too. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the, of, of the day of God, because of the, which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So, as we join here, again, we see Peter coming back to this idea. Number one, we see at the beginning, he says, this is my second letter. So he's acknowledging that this is, uh, this is the second time that he has sought to stir up his, his believers. And again, these letters are going out across Asia Minor. But it's interesting here, it's important to look at the text closely because he says, this is my second letter that I am writing to you to who? Beloved. It's the, it's the view of, of his beloved flock, people that he knows. Uh, he says, in both of them, I am stirring up what? I'm stirring up your sincere mind. This idea of the sincere mind is one of, 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 a, of a clean mind, of, a, of, a, of an oriented mind, of one that's focused on the word. He's like, I want to stir that part of your mind up. I'm doing it again. And as we mentioned a few weeks ago, he's in this his act of, look, I, I know you may know, you have everything you need. You, I know you may know what I'm telling you again already, but I'm going to stir it up again because it's my job. I only have a few days left. I might, as we mentioned, he might, these might be his last words as he's getting pulled to be executed. He might have been yelling to the, to the, to the, to the, uh, the, the scribe, put this down on paper, you know, as he's getting pulled out. It, it's like that level of urgency and, and desire to get these final words out to, out to his flock, to his beloved. He said, I'm stirring up your sincere way by sincere mind by way of reminder that what that you should remember, should remember what? The predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of Lord of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So what he's saying here is you have the word. You have the word of the Old Testament, you have the commands of your Lord and Savior, and you have it through who? Through the apostles who he's already talked about. Hey, we were there. Hey, bro, we were there. We saw him. We saw him, like, ascended. We saw him glorified. We were there. I was there. You can believe us, is what he's saying, regardless of what the false teachers are telling you. 
Point number one here is your number one defense against false teachers, as we come back to this, including the false teacher in yourself, is your sincere mind, an unpolluted and clear mind that is consistently over and over again in a never-ending, no-finish-line concept mindset of focusing on the word that has been given to you. What word? The word that's been given to you through the predictions of holy prophets that came true, um, predictions about the Messiah, predictions about coming judgment, and the commandment of the Lord and of your who? Lord and Savior. Not some guy. The commandment of your Lord and Savior. He saved you. This is who you should listen to. How did that word get to you? Through the apostles. Because as we saw earlier, he says, you love him though you did not see him. In order to see the truth, this is where we've got to, this is the foundational. In order to see the truth, you must accept the truth of the word of God as truth. Otherwise, you are susceptible to cleverly devised myths. If you deny the absolute truth of the word of God, you are vulnerable to false teaching from others and from yourselves. But if you stand on it and expose yourself to it, expose yourself to the truth that this is and the sin that it reveals in each of us when we stand next to it, and you feel that heat, you feel that like, you know, I know it says, you know, do not steal. Well, I haven't stolen anything this, this, this week. I'm good. Well, really? If you, we don't have time to expand on this, but if you go through what stealing really is, like maybe you're, you're stealing maybe time. Maybe you're stealing in your, there's one, one verse was, earlier this week, it was talking about uh, don't be false in your weights and measures. I was thinking about marketing. Like marketing is often false in its weights and measures. It's the difference between saying, oh, we're a $100 million company when you're really you're an $89 million company. It's like little things, little lies, right? That's stealing. Thou shalt not steal. It just, well, we, I didn't mean to, right? But it just exposes. When you get that close to the mirror here, it's, it shows you, wait, no, dude, you're pretty, you're pretty far from the standard. My point of that is, is that when you get close to this and you feel the heat of this, it's going to make you do one or two things, like, or a few things. You're going to either throw mud at it and say, oh, I don't really believe, I believe some, not all, or it's going to make go, ouch, I don't want to look at that. I'm going to quit looking at it. Or, wow, I've got, I am far from the standard. Lord, save me. What do you, what, what would you have me do? Let me forgive, please forgive me. Who do I need to forgive? Where do I need to repent? Which way do you want to blow this dust? If you do that, guided by the Holy Spirit, you don't need to fear false teaching. You'll spot it. You'll spot it. No problem. Your capacity to spot and expose and willingness to rebuke false teaching is entirely proportional to your proximity to this. And that's one of the reasons why at Trinity Church, as we talked about, we're, we, we, one of our distinctives is that we will feature expository teaching. It's always going to be, what does the word say? Not as what does some teacher say? What does this say? And we're always going to come back to this. That's going to be, that's the way we operate. Because it takes, takes us out of it. It just says, how do we take what's here and broadcast it? In a recent interview, Jordan Peterson, who's a famous psychologist, many of you may, may, be rec may, may know and see him around on every social media channel, at least on my feeds, um, there was a clip, and, and he argues uh, that the Bible is a text upon which all other texts depend. Really interesting point I had never thought about. This essentially means that the Scripture occupies a special place in displaying, setting, and perpetuating truth. He says it's the origin of all truth. He says it's not that the Bible, it isn't that the Bible is true, it's that the Bible is the precondition for all manifestation of the truth, which makes it truer than true. I thought that was pretty interesting. He was basically saying if you look at human literature, it's all derived from one library of books. In fact, the Bible was the first book. 
That's a mind-blowing thing. Now, Jordan Peterson, I believe, is a man that's on a journey. He's getting pulled. It's interesting to watch. Um, he says, it's a whole different kind of true. I think, it, I think it's not only literally the case, factually, I think it can't be any other way is what he said. We welcome Dr. Peterson to this revelation and pray that God will continue to draw him to salvation in Christ. He's a powerful, influential person. Um, what I see in him is a man that's viciously in pursuit of the truth and willing to let go of things, uh, let go of past stories in lieu of new facts. Um, That's where we have to stand. If you stand any other place than that, you will be driven by the waves and the wind of whatever the latest thing is. You'll constantly be searching. You'll constantly be looking for something new. You'll constantly be looking for something else. It's always this thing. Instead, you can just come here. It's truer than true. It's the origin of all truth right here. Imagine that right here. But why do we ignore it? Sinful desires, that's what we see in the scripture. Sinful desires, they're following their, following their, in the last days they will come following their own sinful desires. Why do we do this? Why do we follow our own sinful, sin, uh, sinful desires? As we've talked about before, you can trace every single sin, everything that we're doing, it all comes back to one sin, pride, which says, I know better than God. It's always pride. What's the device that we use to ignore the truth? Stories. Stories are device for us to ignore this. That is to say, I say what is true, not this says what is true. We ignore the truth, we ignore facts, and we create our own story that says that we create our own story that gives me what I want instead of what God commands. It goes back to right back to the beginning. All we have to do is go back to Genesis 3 and the first false teacher. It's the difference between what God said and what I say. That's really what it comes down to. Let's look at the nature of a story. Now, we're going to come back to the Genesis 3 example, but if we look at what he's given us here right here, he is, uh, we see the scoffers are using a story. The story of the scoffers. Let's look at it. So if you join me in the text, uh, verse four or verse three he says, first of all, know, knowing this, first of all, the scoffers will come. So he's just saying, you, I'm promising you they will. And we see it today. I turn on the news, turn on anything, and you'll see a scoffer. Probably experience a scoffer. Maybe you've experienced somebody saying, uh, you know, whatever. Even about the word. Most, de most definitely they'll come after the word. They make fun of. In the last days, they will, they, scoffers will come with their scoffing, their mocking, following what? Their own sinful desires. They will say, here's the story. What is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Their story is, Jesus isn't coming. Why? Because nothing has changed since the beginning. So, here's, that's the lie. We're going to see that that's a lie. Nothing has changed since the beginning. Actually, it has changed from the beginning. They're completely, as we'll see, they're deliberately overlooking the facts. But their lie is, I just want you to see this, the structure of the story. Jesus is not coming. How do I know? Well, because everything stayed the same. Lie. So what is the outpouring logic of that lie? Well, I don't need to fear judgment. So I'll follow my own sinful desires. There's no judgment. I don't even worry about it. This goes back to what Paul had written, written, uh, written numerous letters again saying, hey, just because you're free in Christ doesn't mean you should just go sin willfully. It says, by, by no means. Like, that's, a, that's an abuse of grace. If you, that's, not the, that's not the heart of the believer. That's not, that's not our orientation. But that's what these teachers were teaching. Hey, you're free in Christ, man, do whatever feels good. You do you. Be, have your best life today. Feel, follow whatever makes you happy. So there's their story. Jesus isn't coming because nothing's changed. So I don't need to fear judgment. So I'll do what I want. Okay? So 
the lies lead to, your lies lead to your logic, which leads to, as we'll see, your destruction, or at best, your discipline. What are the steps of this story? As we, as we said, like, there, he's embedding this, this, this lie in here that they are deliberately overlooking. What, so, if we look, so if we look at the facts, what are the facts of this? The false teachers say, it's been this way from the beginning. The facts are what? The facts are actually, they deliberately overlook what fact? this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, that by these means, and, and, by, and that by these means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. So, they're overlooking the fact that it hasn't always been this way. It was this way, and then it was created by the Word of God, and then it was deluged, and it perished. And then he continues, And by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist, means the ones that now exist are not like the ones that existed before, right? So it's, the world is different after the flood, Distinctly different. We don't have time to go into all of that, but distinctly different post-flood versus pre-flood. Um, but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So he's saying, like, they're ignoring that they're, they're saying it's always been this way, but in fact, it's not always been this way. They're, 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 they they they, pro they propose to be teachers of the truth, and yet they edit the story, as we often do. We edit the story to serve our own needs. We leave out the little part of the Bible we don't want to, I don't want to look at that. I don't like that. It makes me un uneasy. As I think we've said many times, the Bible is often easy to read, not always easy to swallow. But I'm going to edit that. That's what they were doing. They're just going to take that part out. And it's always been this way, so I don't need to fear judgment, so I'm going to do what I want. Peter's saying, let me look at the facts. I'm going to bring the facts to the front. In light of these facts, um, there's judgment and destruction coming for them. Judgment for even us, right? We're all going to be judged. Um, let's take another example. Same idea. Let's go back to Genesis Where's my Genesis verse? Um, Susanna, this is where Susanna makes a joke about me having too much paper. <laughs> Genesis 3, oh, that's easy. Let's look at this. Let's look at this example as well, right? Genesis 3, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other beasts of the field and the Lord God, the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden and neither shall you touch it lest you die. But then the serpent said to the woman, here's the lie. You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was of delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate and the eyes were both were open and they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths and so forth. And we know the ending of that story. What was it? My sinful desire. My pride. Satan's trying to get some more in the collusion of his same pride. I want to be like and above God. Worship me instead of God. He's saying, you can be like this too. Don't you want to be like God? You should be like God. Appeal directly to the pride of the flesh of Eve. God said that you will die. That was the truth. Satan inverts it. Surely you're not going to die. Did he really say that? Attacks the word creates a new story. Surely you're not going to die. You're going to be like God. 
And inside of that new story, they make some decisions based on a lie, which is to eat the fruit because I'm not going to die. But we know that as the result, they suffered destruction and discipline and sin came into the world and they were cast out of the garden with the first murder coming soon thereafter. The point here is, again, your lies, when you let your lies of others or your own lies lead to your own logic, that logic, more often than not, is going to lead to your own destruction or at least discipline. So how do you course correct? We've got to exchange these things. We've got to exchange God's word, exchange our lies for God's word, exchange our truth, or our, our logic, rather, for God's truth. Because God's truth will lead not to destruction, but lead to knowledge of God's redemptive work in each of us. And when we recognize that redemptive work, the only response can be sub- repentance and submission. Lord, save me. It's Peter. I go back to, I mean, this is the guy that stepped off the boat, looked at the waves, started drowning, put his hand up, Lord, save me. So, We all have stories about each other. We have stories about our current situation. We have stories about our job. We have stories about our spouse. We have stories about our parents. We have stories about our circumstances. We have stories about everything. We have stories about our church. We have to investigate these stories. If we just let them run as a piece of software in the background and we never test them, there's a good chance, especially if we don't investigate the origin of that story. Where did that story come from? What is is that story in service to? Most of our stories are in service to ourself, our own, frankly, our own pride. But there's some steps. Here's some questions to write down. Steps to investigate. So how do I investigate a story? Well, number one, you got to ask yourself, what is the story I'm telling myself about this, about this situation? What is the story I'm telling myself about this situation? That person's lazy. Okay, that's the story you're telling. That person doesn't like me. My wife, blah. My husband, blah. My child, blah. My church, blah, whatever. I'm saying blah a lot. Um, but then we have to ask, is this true? Is this story true? Is it 100% true? And that's the caveat. Is it true? Because our natural thing is, to be, yeah, it's true. Yeah, no, that's true. That's my story. It's true. It must be true. I, w- I wouldn't be telling myself a lie. We don't like to admit that we tell ourselves lies. We're all liars every day, every single day, all the time. We're lying about something. It's in our nature. We have to be able to be willing to ask, is this story I'm telling 100% true? And the, and, the, and the litmus test there is, would I bet my life on it? And you go, uh, I don't know if I bet my life on it. You know, John's an attorney. Would I, would I, would I, would I go to, would I, could I prove it in court? Here's an even bigger one. Could I prove it in the court of God? And you'd be like, oh, I don't know about, I don't know about that one. Okay. Well, then if it's not 100% true, then what is it? Well, I, let me ask myself another question. What would be possible if this story wasn't true? What if it wasn't true that that person was lazy? Well, maybe I'll see that they're not lazy, or maybe I'd see there's something else going on. Maybe it's a loosening of your story. It's a loosening of the grip on this, that this is true. Then you ask yourself your question, what are the facts What are the facts? Not the feelings. What are the facts of this situation? Well, that person's lazy. What are the facts? Well, that person actually does this amount of work that I see them do all these things. Well, I guess it's not, I guess they're not really lazy. It was easier to tell myself I was lazy, they were lazy because I'm angry at them. So what are the facts of the situation? And once you start accounting for those facts, just as Peter gives here, he says, don't overlook these facts. What are the, f- the, the false teacher says, it's been this way from the beginning. He says, well, wait a minute, look at the facts. Actually, it was this way, then it was this way, now it's this way. And oh yeah, it's going to be another way in the future. What are the facts of the situation? Next question. What would be God's perspective on this situation? That's a powerful one. 
uh, what, what would God think about this? It's almost the what would Jesus, what would Jesus do? It's a little cliche, but it's actually always a good question to ask. What would Jesus do? What would his, be his perspective of the situation? If he was standing right here in my shoes and was looking at this, what would he, how would he view this person? How would he view this situation? How would he approach it? And then ask, what story would God's word give me in this situation? And investigate it. Go to work. What does God's word and my knowledge of it say about this situation? And once I recognize that, what action or direction does what is revealed to me cause me to take? Once I have done that investigation, am I, do I feel a push, a direction to go some way or to take some action? And instead, take an action not based on the old software of lies and a false narrative, but instead take an action based on the truth of the Word of God. A theological note here is that the literal, at this point about, about the creation narrative that's called forth here, about um, uh, that, that Peter references, is that a literal belief in creation, in Adam and Eve and Noah's flood and so forth, are, are essential for a true understanding of God's work both then and now. To deny these things undermines the very foundation of our faith. Sadly, many Christians will for, willfully forget these things and in doing so, willfully put them themselves in the flock of scoffers. Well, Noah's ark is more like that boat with the thing, the story. It's a story. It's a very cool story. But we know that all cultures have a flood narrative and it's a combination of this, that, and the other and it didn't really happen that way. And, you know, it probably only flooded a piece of the earth. And it, that's scoffing. That's mocking. That's mocking the word of God. The universe is 13.77 billion years old, although, by the way, they just revised it a billion direct, one direction or the other. Says who? Says man. Since when? Last couple, maybe last 70 years. Oh, that's true. How do you know? Because it's on NASA. Who put it there? I don't know, some guy. Hubble. Okay. I'm going to believe that over what the Word of God says. That's the simple one, right? That's the, you know, it's those little things in our culture that implant that. If you step back and actually think about what you're doing, you're scoffing at the Word of God. Who are you? Um, as an aside, though, there was a point here that, that Annie Grace, uh, or yesterday, Suzanne, this is the memory verse for this month, I believe one John, first for John, first chapter, uh, verse one. <clears throat> In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Chapter, I'll uh, do verses, uh, the next verse. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him there is not anything made that was made. The, these, that, those verses right there, I mean, I, when she said it, I was, I was just like, that's, if you teach a child, that, that verse will, will, will defeat false teaching your whole life. Right there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him not anything was made that was made. Why are those particular verses so powerful? They establish the authority of the Word and Scripture and the supremacy of Jesus Christ as the author of all things and the King of the universe, the end. That is, I, I, it brought, it just my heart exploded when I heard her rattle that off. Um, so that is a, a powerful defense versus false teaching. But let's, let's come back to this conversation of stories. So what happens when, um, when we get a new story? And that's what Peter does. Peter gives his readers a new story. He says, don't believe what they say. Believe what the facts say, the facts of the word of God. And he lays out what happens. He says, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with, the word, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient with you. He's not delaying 
out of procrastination. He is being patient. He's holding back the wrath that is due to the whole world. Why? Because he's not wishing that anyone should perish, that any should perish, that all should reach repentance. But, but the day, and we're, well, let's, let's pause there. It's important here because some will say it's meant for all. Everyone will be saved. It's, that's not the case. We're clearly t- told that there will be those. The gate is narrow that uh, the leads to life. The, the, the one that leads to hell is wide. He's talking to beloved. He's saying you, those called. He's like, I'm, I'm talking to those that are called and there's more to come. And I want to delay because I want to gather the whole flock. He's being patient, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day day, day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and and the heavenly bodies which will be burned up and dissolved will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. So we're going to examine the facts here just for our own awareness of what Peter lays out as the facts. Number one, your judgment of time, the false teachers, uh, is a lie. They're saying, you know, it's, it, they're, they're trying to uh, rationalize the way time works. Uh, Peter is actually quoting an idea from Psalm 90, uh, verse 4. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the, in the night. All time is as nothing before him in the presence of in the presence, as in the nature of God, all is eternity. Therefore, nothing is long, nothing is short. Before him, there is no lapse of ages that impairs his purposes. That's a quote from a commentary by Clark. Another quote uh, from Spurgeon says, describing this idea of time the way God thinks about it, he says, all things are equally near and present to his view, and the distance of a thousand years before the occurrence of an event is no more to him than would be the interval of a day. With God, indeed, there is neither past, present, nor future. He takes for his name the I am. He is the I am. I am in the present. I am in the past. I am in the future. Just as we say of God that he is everywhere, so we may say of him that he is always. He is everywhere in space. He is everywhere in time. So don't get caught up on the idea. Like We, time, we can get into a whole quantum discussion around time, and that could be really cool. We'll do that offline. I like that stuff. But the idea here is that our perception of time is limited to our, you know, our, our, our limitations in these you know, three dimensions. Um, so don't think that we can perceive the way God operates. His coming is not due to delay, but due to mercy for believers, not the ungodly. The, the delay is so that he may gather his entire flock, all, all of the believers, the beloved, But when it comes, the facts are that when it comes, it will come with no warning, like a thief, suddenly. And the perishable universe and the world we perceive, which isn't 13.75 billion years old, it's about 6,000, is going to dissolve. It is a perishable universe. It's a perishable world. Everything we see is perishable. Perishable built only for what? For the work to be a container, an envelope for the work of God's redemptive power. And he's going to make it all dissolve. And the word that you see over and over here at the end is three times he mentions this word dissolve. Since for the, in, the, in the verses that actually follow this, I'm stealing a little bit of Vadim Sunder, uh, not Vadim, <laughs> Vikram. And we see, we see Peter mention three times this word dissolve. We see in the, in the following verse, we see, where it says in verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, we see in verse 12, uh, the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and um, that the heavenly bodies will melt. <clears throat> it's this idea of absolute to the quantum level disillusionment of reality. Why? What's going to happen? It, it, we, we hear in Luke and in Revelation, so that all things may be revealed. <clears throat> Luke 8, 17, it says, For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is there anything secret that will not be made known and come to light. This is the prediction of this promise that is coming, is that when the day of the Lord comes, 
everything we see, everything for, down to the most basic element is going to be dissolved. Leaving what? Leaving only the truth. As we see in Revelation, Revelation 20, uh, we see where it talks about, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated in it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away. No place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. The book, uh, Then another book was open, which is the book of life. And the great were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. According to what they had done. You see, we are all going to be judged on what we have done. For the unrighteous, their sin will be all that is there. And there will be only hell and damnation for them. But for those in Christ, those who are covered by the blood of Christ, God will only see His Son. And we're told, instead of seeing um, the sin, we, we're, we'll, what we have done will also be seen. Those that those things that where we have stored up an imperishable, uh, in, an imperishable, undefiled, unfading inheritance, as uh, Peter described in the first letter, where he says, "According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded." through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. This again is in uh, the first letter of Peter chapter one. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when God sees us on those, that last day. He does not see our sin. He sees only the inheritance. He looks at us and he sees his son and says, you are an heir along with him. So if we look at the facts of this story, of what Peter is laying out, if we look at the actual facts, as opposed to what the false teachers say, which they say he is not coming back. Instead, we look at the facts of the following. Jesus is coming back. And he will come back delayed? No, he's going to come back suddenly. And all of reality will be dissolved, and all that will be left is what each has done. All things will be exposed, and all things will be judged. And after this judgment, a new heaven and earth will be established because of his promise. He says, according to his great promise, in verse 13, According to his great promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So he will come. Everything will be dissolved. All sin will be judged and put aside. All of the inheritance that we have stored up will be counted and will be rewarded. And then we will move forward into a new earth and a new heaven where there is no sin and only fellowship with our Lord and Savior and our Father. You see, again, our lies lead to our logic, which leads to our destruction or, again, at the minimum, discipline. Instead, we must exchange this with God's word, which leads to God's truth, which leads to God's redemptive work in us, and the only response to that is repentance and submission to the truth. But here's the, here's the key thing. It's with urgency. It's with urgency. As we're told, we should not be, um, we, we need to be looking forward to what is coming. But at the same time, recognizing that we are not on our time, we are on God's time. One of the biggest lies we can tell ourselves is, I've got all the time in the world to do this, that, and I can uh, to do these things. I've got all the time in the world to forgive. I've got all the time in the world to correct my sin. I've got all the time in the world to 
love that person. I've got all the time in the world to be obedient. I've got all the time in the world to figure it out. And that's a lie. We're told that he will come like a thief in the night. Suddenly, God willing, this afternoon, or maybe right after you hear this message. But the point here is that it should this response to the facts should generate an urgency in our posture and behavior in our lives. We're told over and over again throughout the books we've studied, Philippians, first the first letter of Peter, be sober-minded, ready for action. Over and over again, we're reminded of these things. And what must it do? It must increase our urgency in our life to investigate our stories, to investigate what is true and false, to create an urgency in our lives to act, to create an urgency in your life to speak the word, to repent, to forgive, to love, to sin less, to perhaps let go of the past. There must be an urgency in your life to seek the truth, seek facts, seek the word, and, be, and have an urgency to exchange our own pride-built stories with the truth of God's absolute true truth of his word. So my question for you is right now in your life, what stories do you have about your life? What stories do you have about perhaps your spouse? What stories do you have about your children? What stories do you have about your career, your job? What stories do you have right now about your body and where you're at? What stories do you have right now about your past? Perhaps there's something there that says you could never be forgiven or you could never be redeemed or you're not forgiven, your own stories. What stories do you have right now about God? And what would be possible if you challenge these stories today? What would have to be true for you to be wrong and be able to accept that you're wrong? And perhaps you've been wrong your whole life. That one hurts. To come to a place where you recognize that when you investigate this story, that it's been something you've been believing for years or maybe your whole life. And that you're going to have to admit that you've been wrong. There's something that is ego pulverizing in that place. And if that revelation, if that possibility crushes your ego, crushes your own desire to be in control, crushes your own will of your will over God's will, you can almost be certain that it's the right path. Because it forces us to acknowledge that we are liars, that you are a liar. You're lying about something. And it may be not overtly right now lying to another person, but you're lying in that you're keeping this story going that is not based on facts, but it's based on feelings. It's not based on the facts of this book. It's not based on the facts that there was a man that was here on earth that lived absolutely sinless, that walked directly down the path God had for him and was his divine purpose. And as a result of that, he was the only sacrifice that would atone for all of the sins of you and me and everyone else. And then through him, through acknowledgement of him, through declaring he is the one, and that only through him may someone come to, to the Father, that only through him and only through his blood and his sacrifice are we atoned for. That when we accept that, we recognize that no matter what situation we're in, we can let go of the pride-driven victim story that we have. We can let go of the lies that are protecting us from feeling the truth. So where right now in those stories are you acting like a victim, perhaps, in a story in your life somewhere? What happened to you? 
or maybe what all you've done, leading to a phrase of, I deserve. Do you really? What would be possible instead of you relinquish this idea or the, any story where you were the victim and you exchanged it for the absolute fact that in and through Christ, you are always, always a victor because he is always victorious. And in that victory, you've been given the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that says you are forgiven. You can be. Just accept the gift. Perhaps there's a story right now that's blocking the acceptance of that gift. What is one story right now that you're going to challenge? One story right now that you're going to be willing to ask yourself, is this thing I tell myself actually true? And test, test that story against the absolute truer than truth word of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this letter that you've given us. Thank you for the truth that we have access to. Whether we want to look at it or not, we can't deny uh, the effect of the truth. It makes us make a decision. It makes us see you. Lord, I ask that whoever hears this message that they... Uh, they're able to have the blindfolds taken off their eyes that that in whatever story is currently op giving them the operating system that they have that if it is not based on your word that that the lies inside of it are revealed and that whoever hears this message has the courage and you give them the courage to let go of stories that are not from you and to seek your truth the only truth in the word that you have given us and in doing so access the absolute unyielding overwhelming forgiveness and mercy that you have made available to us through your son jesus christ Let peace and love and acknowledgement of the truth come into the hearts of every person that hears this. We ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.